Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Bolt Action Reloading. In today's video, we're going to help you find new accuracy in your second-hand rifle. The platform we're going to use is the Tika M695, chambered in 30-06. Stick around. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you'd like to see how I and the rest of the community here make our group smaller, start now by subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon. That way you get notified when I post next week's video and you won't miss anything. For this week's video, we're going to be going over a new platform and showing how we're going to try and get some new accuracy out of this secondhand rifle. This rifle belongs to one of my relatives, and let's just say we're not exactly mesmerized by the accuracy that we've been able to achieve with this rifle. So I volunteered to do a little bit of work on it, see what we could do, and see what kind of group size we could get this rifle down to. We're actually going to show later in the video some of the groups that we shot with this rifle just to get a baseline, but we're going to try and do a little bit of a step-by-step -step analysis of some things we're going to do. We're going to try and figure out how we're going to be able to get some more accuracy out of this rifle. Don't think this is only going to apply to this M695 or even only a .30-06. The methods that we're going to talk about are going to be able to be applied to just about any rifle in any caliber, but we're going to be using this rifle as our example. The first thing that's very important is knowing that the rifle is actually safe to fire. If it's been firing factory ammunition and you're just not happy with their performance, you're pretty sure it's going to be safe to fire. But if you just picked it off a used rack, some of the items might be a little bit optional, but these are the steps that I like to go through to make sure that our platform has a highest chance of being successful. There's no guarantees when we start out, but if we found some early signs of problems, we would know uh, not to waste hours of our lives trying to chase something that wasn't very likely to happen. But in this particular case, our rifle is in pretty good shape. Uh, one of the things that I really like to do because I have a boroscope was take a look down the rifle barrel. And if you have the option to do this, I certainly would recommend it. I'll put it on your screen for you as you can just take a quick look down the barrel and see that relatively speaking, it's in good shape. Rifling is clean. We don't see any reason that this might have been a trade-in where uh, somebody would have damaged the interior of the rifling or anything like that. The barrel's in great shape and we can check that off our list of things that we've checked. One of the other things I like to do if possible is to dry fire the rifle a little bit. Make sure that trigger feels consistent. I don't feel any problems with that. If you have a trigger pull gauge, getting some consistent readings with a trigger pull gauge is very helpful in my opinion. It's just going to give you an idea if the trigger is actually releasing in the same point every time. And this one is very consistent. This is the first Tika that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And honestly, the first thing that really impressed me is the trigger. Our trigger pro weight pulled a very consistent, pretty much two pounds, 13 ounces, give or take a little bit. That's what the 10 pull average ended up being. For a factory hunting rifle, I was honestly very surprised and was suspicious that maybe some trigger work had been done. So going on the internet, which is always a great source, obviously, that's why you're here, right? I pulled up some tech specs on a similar rifle. I had a little bit of trouble finding the plastic molded stock model but I'm going to assume that the 93 vintage, at least that's what the serial number looks like for this particular rifle. And the technical data I found on something very similar said the single stage trigger pull is adjustable from two to four pounds. So our two pounds and 13 ounces is right in the middle of there. It makes me very comfortable. We're still dealing with our stock trigger pull weight. And let me tell you, this is one of the nicest triggers I've ever had the pleasure of firing. If you guys are fans of the channel, I'll tell you right out of the gate, this trigger is way better than the X mark trigger that's on my factory 308. Hands down, this trigger is wonderful for a factory trigger. The other thing I like to know is the barrel length. If you can't find the technical specs and you really want to know, I'd recommend getting a cleaning rod, putting a cleaning rod down the end, obviously being careful not to damage your barrel, inserting there, making a mark on your cleaning rod, taking it out and measuring to the bolt face. And that's going to give you a very good idea of what your barrel length is. In this particular case, if you guys are fans of millimeters, it's 570 millimeters. Translated to standard units, that's going to be 22 and 7 sixteenths of an inch. Forgive me when we're going to shorten that to 22 and a half inches because that is the easiest thing for me to remember. So 22 and a half is roughly what our barrel length is. Why that's going to be important to us is when we run our factory ammunition through our rifle, we're going to want to have a rough idea of what our velocity expected versus measured is. Because yes, we're going to use a chronograph to determine if the rifle is shooting the expected speed, or at least close to it. Now, my personal favorite thing to do after we're sure that the rifle is safe to fire, kind of get all the details, whether you do it now or afterward, knowing that this particular rifle has a three round magazine, not necessarily the number of rounds, but as much as the actual magazine length, taking a quick measurement, it looks like 
we're going to be able to use a maximum overall length in our rifle of somewhere around three and a half inches. If you're familiar with 30-06, 3.34 inches is SAMI spec. So if we want to get some bullets a little bit closer to the lands to see if we can find some accuracy there, looks like we're going to have plenty of room to do it. Knowing our magazine length, things that we might want to talk about, any other things that might be causing inaccuracy in our rifle is anything that's obvious, loose screws on our scope base, on our scope rings, or even our action screws. In this particular case, we didn't really find anything, but we're going to take it out to the range, shoot some groups. We're going to shoot five three-shot groups. I'm not a huge fan of three-shot groups. I don't necessarily who was the first one to say it, but you don't necessarily know your load is good with three rounds, but it is something you can tell that it's bad if it's in three rounds. So if you've already got a three-inch group with three rounds, there's no need to keep going. You know it's just not what you're looking for. And three-inch groups is something about this rifle with shooting. We're going to make sure that the scope is sighted in, get some groups, make some adjustments, and see where we're at. One of the other things I might not have mentioned early on, this rifle's missed a couple deer lately. We really don't want to overlook anything. So we're going to treat this just like it was its first time out to the range, which it is for me. We took it out and started with a three-shot group. I'll put the three-shot group on your screen. Not that it's significantly important, but you might notice, at least for my cheek weld, the group ended up being about six inches right, as well as at least six inches high. I was af afraid of over-adjusting. I made a small adjustment, shot another three-shot group. Our first three-shot group was a 2.25 MOA group. Shooting our second group, we went out to 2.208 MOA. So, slight improvement, but nothing really measurable. I don't think I had the best rest setup I could possibly have but I don't think I was inducing a ton of inaccuracy as we went along. Uh, our second combination was actually some 150 grain reloads that I'd had worked up for another 30-06 rifle. I knew they would be safe in this rifle. They were, they were loaded very light. Shooting those didn't get any better. 2.806 MOA is what we got with that, and we did a little bit more zeroing. For today's test, we also went through 280 grain combinations. The first 180 grain was Herders. This is some relatively new. It's, I think this ammunition is only two or three years old. It's certainly a lot newer than the other ammunition that we were using, which is probably a good 25 years old. Our Herders is our newest ammunition we were trying. This is what I was most comfortable with basing our expected velocity on. Looking up our expected velocity, the box is going to say 2,700 feet per second in a 24-inch barrel. Keep in mind, 22 and a half inches is what we're working with, so anything a little under 2,700 is not going to be unexpected. This honestly shot our best group of the day with this rifle at 1.094 MOA. Our average velocity was 26.99, actually. So extreme spread of the three shots was 28. Nothing extraordinary, but certainly the best group that we shot. To continue on with our baseline, we thought we'd try the other Winchester 180 grain projectiles. Shot a three-shot group with them. Uh, 1.737 MOA is what we got. Extreme spread was only 30 on those three shots from top to bottom. Not spectacular, but certainly a lot more reasonable than what we got with our 150 grain charges and gave us some baseline to work with. Now, not only is our velocity important, but also our cartridges, because shooting this factory brass is going to give us some ideas of some dimensions that we're going to use for reloading. Now, before I go too far, there's one thing that I want to reach out to my audience on. This is a empty shell casing. So after we've chambered our round, the one thing during inspection that I found interesting during this is that this rifle doesn't seem to eject brass. So you guys notice when I eject this piece of brass, it barely comes out. Uh, any factory hunting rifle I've ever seen uh, ejects brass uh, pretty violently. And so I was very surprised that the ejection was so weak on this. I actually have taken apart the bolt. If I have a picture, I'll put it on your screen of the actual length of the ejector spring. There was no modification that I could tell to the spring that made it look like it was not performing exactly the way it was designed to. And doing a little bit of research, it doesn't seem that the springs are easy to get by themselves and certainly not very inexpensive. So I didn't want to have to end up buying the entire bolt kit, spring kit, which wasn't in stock anyway, just to find out if that was the factory length. But if you guys have any tips or if any of you guys know that that's normal, I'd appreciate it if you let me know in the comment section below and for anybody else that's interested. So guys, basically there's two steps left that we need to talk about. The first step we want to know um, when we get ready to do our reloads is the actual headspace dimensions on our brass. Now, put a picture of a tool on your screen. This is the Hornady Headspace Comparator Gauge. Uh, not only can you do headspace, you can also do a bullet comparator. Uh, you just have to use different inserts. I've got videos on this, and so I'll put cards up at the end of the video if you want to check those out to see exactly how you use those tools. But 
Essentially, you're going to find the headspace dimension to find out how much the brass expands in the chamber to give you an idea of how far you want to resize. Depending on what you want to call it, most people slang it bump sizing. When I used my D400 Hornady insert, the dimension that we got on the three different variations of brass that we had, Federal, Herders, and Winchester, we had dimensions all ranging between 1.997 inches and 1.999 inches. Basically, that's going to give us an idea of how far we need to bump our shoulders back. Our real goal is going to be about 1.996 inches. Basically, we're looking for a one to two thousandths bump. You really want to know this measurement from whatever brass you intend to reload, and so it, it did vary a little bit by brand. In the next video that we talk about this rifle, when we actually get started reloading for it, uh, we're going to go into sticking what brass we're going to pick, what projectiles we're going to load, but we're going to go through a little bit more information. So from our range trip today, we've determined what our headspace is going to be. In this particular case, it was only growing two to three thousandths, so the factory ammo really isn't expanding our brass a lot more than our goal for our reloads would be. So that's good to know. The other thing we'd like to measure which is the overall length. Now, there's several different ways of doing it. You could take a neck resized piece of brass, split it in half, and insert that into your chamber. Essentially, however your process is for doing it, if you watch my Hornady overall length gauge and bullet comparator set, I like to remove the bolt, put it in our modified case, and for any of the projectiles I might want to load, I would like to know the distance before the bullet touches the lands. And we've done that on this rifle. Just in case you're interested for future reference, though, this is certainly not going to be a guarantee of anybody else's rifle that they get. I'll put some of the projectiles we put on the screen here. One of the bullets we're going to like to try is the 150 grain spear gold dot. The distance to the lands on that is 3.329 inches, so well below Sammy spec. We're going to also try out the 168 grain spear gold dot, and its cartridge overall length of the lands is actually slightly shorter at 3.315 inches. The biggest interesting thing to me on this list is that most of these projectiles actually touch the lands well before the 3.34 inch SAMI spec, which tells me that loading close to the lands is not going to be difficult, and I'm very optimistic we're going to be able to find some accuracy in this platform. Generally speaking, uh, if you had to pick one dimension to try, shooting somewhere around 20 thousandths off the lands is a good starting place. It's a place I like to start, assuming that your combination will tolerate that. A lot of times just moving a bullet a little bit closer to the lands will improve your group significantly and that may very well be the case for us today. The only one on that entire list is a 230 grain A-tip which probably isn't a very good candidate for our rifle. One of the technical details that I should have mentioned earlier in the video is the actual twist rate of this rifle. This is a 1 in 11 twist and so heavier bullets might be a little bit more of a struggle. Knowing the twist rate of our rifle and if it didn't handle heavyweight projectiles very well we would know exactly why and know that we were pushing our limits trying anything any heavier than that. So if we had issues loading 220 grain bullets, it would be obvious. Now we know that we had pretty good luck with our 180 grains, and so it seems like the 1 in 11 twist isn't having any trouble with those, at least stabilizing them, but even the groups looked good, so we can't complain about that. The only projectile that has a cartridge overall length to the lands that's longer than 3.34 inches is actually the Hornady A-tip, which states on the box it requires a 1 in 9 twist, so not a very good chance that our rifle is going to stabilize that. And getting it to the lands is 3.602 inches, so if we were loading to our magazine length, we'd still be jumping 100 thousandths. If we try that for fun, I'm not going to promise we won't, but generally speaking, I would not be optimistic to have great results with it. Either way, that's kind of the starting point. If you're interested to see where this rifle goes, I really hope you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so you get notified when I post the next videos on this rifle. Any comments or questions you have, please put those in the comment section below. Like I said, we're going to walk this rifle through our entire process, coming up with a good load for this. And I'm very optimistic we're going to be able to get a low SD load. Groups under an inch I don't think are going to be a problem in any way, shape, or form. I think the owner of this rifle is going to be thrilled to death with the performance that we're going to be able to get out of this secondhand rifle. Even if you're not reloading for a secondhand rifle, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you're interested in any of the tools that I talked about earlier, the cartridge overall length gauge and the comparator gauges, I'll put links up here in the videos so you guys could check those videos out. I hope to see you guys come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.